Hello everyone, welcome to Rabung Maja. We, we should wait for uh, another minute and we'll start. Um, good evening everyone. Uh, for all of you guys who already joined, um, we will wait a little bit and before before we are we are starting the presentation, I would like to start uh, like a small introduction. First of all, uh, uh, I would like to say hi to Felipe as the principal and the co-founder of Pala Atelier. Uh, hello, Felipe. And hello. Uh, thank you for, for coming and doing this. So it's a big appreciation from us from Indonesia. Um, for all of you guys who already for the first uh, who first time for being here or who already been here for a couple of times. Uh, welcome to our 19th edition. And this is quite special. That's why we name it as the A to Z Architects Special Public Lecture because uh, we used to only invite it like some person who, are, who ever worked for, for someone renowned architects. But this time we got the chance to, to visit, uh, sorry, to invite uh, the man himself, the principal himself of the, of the the architectural firm, which is Father Atelier. So this is quite special for us. Um, I would like to start with a small story between me and Vala, actually. I was studying in Politecnico di Milano on 2016 and until 2018. Uh, on the second year, uh, sorry, on the second semester, uh, I've been teached by Eduardo Soto de Mora and some other professor from Porto, from FAUP in Porto. And that's how the first time I I knew Portu uh, quite much about Portuguese architecture. I was studying about the architecture of, of Fernando Tavor. I was studying about Alfaro Siza. I was studying about Eduardo Sotomayor with some other Portuguese architects. And the professor also uh, asked us to study about the research about, to doing this research about the city of Porto and also the contemporary of the new Portuguese architecture. And that's how I knew Vala for the first time. The very first time I know Vala, of course, by the representation. I mean, the first time I saw the, the drawing, I, I mean, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen that drawing before. I mean, like back there when, when it was in 2016, uh, in Indonesia, I, I, I haven't seen that, that kind of drawings before. So, so that's, that's how I start to learn how to do it. You know, and that, and that semester I start to, to do this kind of, drawings that so-called post-digital drawings or post-digital images. So it's quite fun. And I, after that, I've always in love to, to try to draw the same, but, but that's not the, the main idea, not how the, how the drawings was not only the, the main idea, but because the design, uh, the design methodology by drawings or the drawings by design methodology. So which one came first? It's always been in my mind. So, so which one came first? And in the lecture of, from Philip in, in Crown Foundation, he also mentioned like uh, between the, the images and between the, the design, which one came first is like the chicken and the egg. So, so I always curious about that. So we decided to invite Fala and Felipe is here. So maybe if you guys uh, have a know about Fala, Fala is a young practice currently based in Porto in Portugal. Palatia was founded in 2013 by three architects, Felipe Magalhães, Ana Luisa Soares, and Ahmed El Koja. Uh, Felipe and Ana Luisa both studied architecture in Porto before going to the faculties at Architectura in Ljubljana and Tokyo University respectively. Ahmed El Koja, was, who was born in Lausanne, uh, studied at ETH Zurich as well as Lausanne, Gothenburg, and Singapore. All these three members started their architecture careers working for Harry Kruger in Basel before moving onto the firms in New York and Tokyo. Philippe practiced with Sana, with Sejima and Nishizawa, Anna Luisa with Toyo Ito, and Ahmed with New York based Obra Architects before joining the Atelier Bauhaus uh, also in Tokyo. So, Philippe and Malgais, uh, uh, born in Porto in 1987, graduated in architecture at FAUP Porto and Faculty of Architecture in Ljubljana. He has worked at Gary Kruger in Basel, Sana, and Sof Fujimoto in Tokyo. So I guess that's all. Uh, let's start the presentation. Uh, yes, I think we are pretty well. So first of all, thank you for the, for the invitation. As I said before, when we were talking just before everyone joined, 
it's the first time I'm going to present our work in Indonesia, even if, well, I'm in Porto, but for an Indonesian uh, audience, let's say. Um, and thank you for creating such a huge expectation to all the guests <laughs> with, your, with your, your introduction. So, um, yes, I agree with everything you said. You stated all the facts. We are a young practice. We are based in Porto. We are free partners, but I would say we are a much bigger team than that. We are 10 people, all of us weird in our own ways, um, here in Porto. Um, we mostly um, produce small scale projects. I would say projects between 50 to 300 square meters. This is the vast majority of our production. Although recently in the last, I would say two years, we are slowly moving or feeling the move towards bigger constructions, mostly uh, collective housing projects in the suburbs of Porto. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show a PDF. And today I prepared a presentation that runs or goes through a few different topics. It starts by addressing exactly ipsis verbis, what you just addressed now, the tools we use to draw the projects, not just the collages, not just what you call the post-digital drawings that indeed are extremely digital because they're all done. 100% on the computer, um, but also about the other tools we use in parallel uh, with them. And after that, I'm gonna move to the real, let's say, to the, to the core of the talk, which is uh, aiming at explaining how we do our projects. Um, and in that case, contextualizing the collage as a part of that uh, long process that is to build a house, to design an apartment, to do uh, anything in, in, in architecture. So. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it perfectly. And okay, um, we can start the presentation, Philip. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Philip Malhais from Palatelier. Enjoy, guys. You definitely are doing the best introduction we ever had. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so Fala, uh, as Randy said, um, we are free partners. So we founded a practice a few years ago. Uh, well in Tokyo and in Porto and in Switzerland. So we didn't have an address at the time and we were kind of floating around different uh, geographies. Um, and when we started the practice, uh, we did not really have a plan. So we didn't know exactly where we were heading. We just knew, and it was very clear for us, we wanted to build, we wanted to, to approach projects uh, always with the ambition of getting to the one-to-one -one scale. So we were lucky enough in the years that followed, so between 2015, 16, 17, until today, to collect uh, a few uh, of these projects, uh, mostly uh, within transformations, mostly within residential briefs, mostly with very small budgets. So these are somehow the three main uh, common denominators uh, to all of our projects from an exterior perspective, from an analytical perspective. But it's also true that we managed to keep what I like to call uh, methodic optimism through all of them. And uh, as we produced these projects, we ended up understanding how uh, we wanted to develop the practice. So if there was no plan when we started, we'd like to believe that there is a plan uh, now. And the first thing I would like to talk about today uh, is about uh, lenses um, and lenses as a metaphor to the different perspectives we have of uh, the production we do. And we, let's say, we can use a lens as a tool or we can do, use a tool as a lens. And in this case, I'm, I would like to start by talking about the most common tool uh, that is the hand drawing, you know, like the sketch. Uh, one of those we do thousands a day, right? So, and I would argue that every single project starts somewhere here, you know, and every single decision along the project also. Like we have a lot of sketching paper on the tables, you know, draft paper, and every day we produce maybe 200 of these pages. It's, it's some people have notebooks, some people just use the back of envelopes. And uh, the hand drawing, uh, let's say the sketch is, um, the most literal translation of whatever is going inside your head to a piece of paper. So it's almost like a transcription. It's almost like we can look at these drawings and read intentions. Um, and many times we try to explain someone 
or something to someone that is next to us. And it's very hard to be precise with words, to be precise with uh, gestures, but with a couple of lines, it becomes clear. And these drawings, although very irrational almost and very intuitive many times, they are the beginning of every architecture project, I would say. And once these drawings start taking a certain, let's say, a certain form, and keep in mind, we don't usually publish them because these are, you know, the hand drawings are pretty much personal uh, moments, I would say. We move to the plan and every project has to start from a plan. So when the project stops being just a series of ideas in the piece of paper or in the point of your pen, it becomes a plan. And the plan is the beginning of everything. So until the plan is in place, until the plan is somehow structured, organized, uh, let's say, making sense, it's very hard for us to move anywhere else. So we like to believe that uh, a project without a good plan is not a project at all. And the plan to us has different readings, of course. The plan talks about program, about proportion. It talks about rhythm. Uh, it talks about organization. Uh, but it also talks about uh, rhetorics. It also talks about uh, composition in a very classical sense. And it is very important for us that after the plan is, you know, becomes or starts uh, assuming the form of what it might be uh, the project in the end, that that form is structured with a very severe uh, rhetorical principle. So it's fundamental for us that a plan is properly drawn. And unfortunately, uh, this was, uh, this was a, an almost mandatory statement uh, in the Renaissance. And in the last 500 years, it became less and less of a topic. And, but we do believe that a properly drawn plan is a fundamental aspect of a properly drawn project. Um, and all the projects we do, one way or another, they find their own logic. Because to draw properly a plan and to quote Renaissance, I'm not thinking necessarily about Bramante. I'm just thinking about having a series of rules and a series of exceptions, because the best rules are the ones that have a good exception and vice versa, uh, structuring each individual project. And these rules, they might take different forms and different ambitions from project to project, but somehow the overall, uh, let's say, uh, ambition, uh, well, to repeat myself, they have is to bring uh, coherence in different ways to different projects. Um, and as the project becomes more and more uh, defined with this, um, let's say, plan and with this rhetoric and with these hand drawings, the collage emerges. And the collage is not a finished product. The collage is not something that is done a posteriori of the project. The collage starts somewhere in the beginning of the project as a kind of dry PSD file with a, a few textures and a few elements. And as the time, you know, as the project evolves and as the time passes, it starts collecting information and it starts collecting furniture and it starts collecting objects. And at some point, it's not just an idea anymore, it's about space. And maybe those objects, they are just there to give scale or they are just there to give a hint on the kind of occupation that we could envision for that space. But many times they are necessary in order to fully understand what that space is going to be like. And the collage is sometimes very literal, sometimes a bit more abstract. And because uh, we started our career mostly working within interior spaces, we have to fully invent these collages, right? We need to define all the surfaces. We need to understand that a floor is not a floor, a ceiling is not a ceiling. They are horizontal surfaces. The white walls become the base that allows us to have bigger, deeper contrasts. And suddenly we are not talking about walls and rooms and doors anymore. We are talking about surfaces and flat uh, objects that are somehow overimposed in a, in a canvas and somehow help us defining a narrative within an architecture project. And other times when we have um, buildings in which we're gonna intervene on the outside or in buildings we're gonna design from scratch, the collage starts relating to the city. So the collage starts talking about nature. The collage starts addressing the sky, the sun, the moon. So the collage starts incorporating in itself elements that are not part of the project, but that will somehow impact the way how the project will be perceived. And to a certain extent, the collage can at some point stop being just about the reproduction of the project as an architectural object but also has this kind of weird element that makes the neighbors 
you know, go to the other side of the street and comment with each other about how nasty that facade looks like. Um, but the collage, as I said, is a tool. So the collage is not a steady object. Uh, and to give you an example, this is a series, a selected series of images of the same collage for the same project. And the collage takes many forms, uh, or let's say the collage allows us to reach many forms in each project very, very fast. So by just moving a few layers, doing a mask, adding an element, changing a color, cropping you know, a surface, adding a texture, suddenly we are experimenting almost um, in real time with what the project could be because the collage is very impressive in the sense that it's if the plan is a series of measurements and rules and facts the collage is somehow the opposite it's very intuitive it's almost something that you react to as if you know as if it's like a punch to you it's not a it's not a mathematical equation so by changing the collage very fast we can very easily and very quickly understand if the project is going or not in the right direction. Um, and at the same time, as we work uh, with the collage, we don't stop working with other tools. As I said before, there's the hand drawing, there's the plan, there's the collage, there's the physical model that many times takes the form of a complete project, as if we need to communicate it mostly to a third party when we need to communicate with a certain client and somehow it helps us as part of the process to, uh, to build a one to 20, one to 50, one to 100 model. And let's say that this experimentation does not end because the building is already under construction. So even on site, the project remains as a creative um, process, let's say. So choosing colors, textures, understanding how a certain color will interact with a certain material is something that, although tested a priori in the project, can only be fully experimented later on on the construction site. And uh, to demystify this idea, we, we render, we render a lot. I mean, and, and more than anyone, our clients understand that. So we do a lot of images and these images, they intend to be, you know, fast sketches that our computer did for us. So they do not replace uh, the collage. They do not um, somehow uh, hide behind the collage. Also, they are part of a process and they give us a precision and uh, let's say um, the simplicity of discourse that, or almost a realism, I would say, that the collage doesn't, so that the plan doesn't, that the model doesn't. So they provide us photos of the space before the space exists within this kind of video game look that renderings have. And many times they are used not as, um, let's say, as a test on, um, or let's say as, a, an, as an image of the final object, but they are used as, uh, let's say, another tool to test how the project is going to look like. So for example, here we see six images of the same project where um, by doing small changes in a texture or in an element, we somehow um, vary the, the actual expression of the, of the building. Um, and again, we go back to the model because let's say this is not a one liner, uh, let's say that this is not a continuous timeline, that's what I meant. So we don't do the sketch and then the plan and then the collage and then the model and then, you know, it's, it's something that goes back and forth and sometimes we believe the project is almost to a point where it's pretty much done and suddenly a new element, a new, a new discussion, a new disagreement provides us the opportunity to go back to the beginning and to re-question the project all over again and to find an even better answer for a problem we didn't know we had so far. Um, and when we draw, uh, of course, when we draw these elevations and when we create this, uh, these drawings, this, this, this kind of uh, unfolded elevations, we follow a series of rules because even that element that feels um, completely um, out of control somehow, that feels almost uh, random, which is a very dangerous word. Um, it's actually carefully calculated and the final result that might seem as an offensive provocation is in reality the right answer to a problem that only we spotted while doing the project. Um, and every single elevation we do, we like to detach it from its real context and to present it over a pink background as if each of these uh, is just a canvas. It's just like a piece that floats uh, in its own uh, isolated universe. And many times they take the shape of figures. Other times they incorporate grids and patterns. Other times they are about stepping a certain volume or understanding the white 
canvas as the beginning of everything. Other times they are just systems and the system defines the facade, not the facade defines the system. And other times they are perfect canvas, so solid shapes where we place certain elements, windows, doors, chimneys, handrails, composing the actual expression of the building. And many times there's a debate about how to end the building. So the three examples above, there's the fronton, there's the crown, there's this element that gives an ending to a composition. And below you have the sloped roof as an element that somehow at 45 degrees cuts um, the relation of the volume with the sky. At the same time, we like to look at inner elevations in the same way we look at exterior elevations. So let's say the elevation is treated the same way. It's represented detached of any context. It's represented following the same scale and the same rules on the drawing, but it's represented in a golden background. And why golden? Because most of our elevations, not to say all of our interior elevations, have uh, white walls and white is to a certain extent the opposite of gold. So if gold means everything in terms of well, the history and religion and so on, white is the absence of materiality, is the absence of textures. So we find this to be a very balanced uh, contrast. Um, and sometimes we like when the project gets to an ending. So when the project is already under construction and we can somehow assume that it took its final form, we like to, to try to, in a single drawing, incorporate all the intentions that the project tried to, to achieve. So a single drawing that tells all the stories I said so far. We call these comprehensive drawings. They are pretty much unreadable for the common eye, but very much comfortable for us. So these are drawings we do for ourselves. We are doing them because we need them as a practice, as a kind of synthesis of everything we attempted while doing uh, these projects and keep in mind these projects sometimes they take one year two years so they take too long to be um, expressed in a single drawing so we could call these planned failures uh, these drawings they are to a certain extent doomed to fail but at the same time we believe it's still very important for us to do them and to somehow compile all of these intentions in a single piece uh, of paper or in a single pdf um, and um, another thing we like to do is to document. We document the work we do, the physical work, the one-to-one -one scale very often, be it in a construction site, so understanding the different stages, the demolition, the transformation, or the improvisation many times where a curve shows up because, you know, there was a pencil and some ladders and, you know, naturally the curve was born. Um, but also to understand, for example, the ironic aspect of certain stages in construction. For example, in this case, you see a series of very thick columns that hold this massive slab that will disappear. So all of these columns will be completely invisible. And then you have the very elegant round columns that are not structural at all, but will somehow become very proud uh, and expressive elements in the space. Um, we also like to document the buildings uh, naturally after construction so when we like to document them um, in a more or less consistent manner so to look at them always from a certain angle and to understand what they have in common in this case the idea of the white wall and the detached elements in front or to document them from weird positions like lying down on the floor and looking up which is something normal people don't do very often um, or just to document very small details, very small moments, I would even call them planned mistakes, and to understand how can they become to a certain extent almost artistic expressions of sorts within, embedded within the project. Um, we also like to see the project in context, of course. We like to understand how the buildings become somehow cutouts of a certain environment. Uh, we like to see how much they fit or not um, in that environment, how much they become, let's say, the ugly duck uh, of their neighborhood. Um, and at the same time, how much they become just that very small pixel in bigger uh, paintings that are, let's say, the living rooms of the neighbors that have that very, very, very tiny element as another of those, of them, of their plants or, uh, objects or clothes uh, visible from the balcony. Um, we also care for abstraction. We also care a lot about understanding the composition of two walls uh, with the same rigor uh, in the patio that no one visits, with the same rigor of a facade facing a street, 
or to be lucky enough sometimes to end up building two buildings next to each other and to have them facing one another or you know aging together let's say um, and this is the last photo on this series to be able to discover a posteriori that that building that tried so hard not to be like the neighbor became exactly like the neighbor a fake beam a fake column a kind of canvas facade a sloped roof it's it's ironic that sometimes you run so much of something just to find it at the end. And um, today I would like to talk also about what I call parallel readings. So the different, um, how can I call it? Uh, the different readings one can have of someone's work, in this case of our pr production. So to understand that the production has of course the building and uh, the, the, the object, the one-to-one -one scale as the logical outcome of the process. So if we are asked to do a project, it's because normally a client or a friend or even ourselves want to build something. But um, besides that logical outcome of the process, there's a lot of other readings one can make on the work. And I would like to somehow explain how, how those readings come out of the of the process itself and i would like to start with this with this image um, from kosuth uh, that has the chair the image of the chair and the description of the chair and this is probably one of the most uh, relatable uh, art pieces to uh, what i want to say that is there's an object and the object is in essence the the, the objective uh, but being able to presented side by side with a specific framing of uh, that object, in this case, V in the photo, or with a specific description of that object, uh, in this case, via the text, makes the object um, exist in three parallel planes. So it's not just a chair anymore, it's a picture of a chair and an idea of a chair or a description of a chair. And we like to believe that uh, within our projects, we achieve or at least we attempt at achieving a similar um, similar result and these obsessions and these readings they have many forms they we could talk about proportion and again go back to the renaissance as an example or about uh, the non-classical proportion and introduce maybe some of the sketches from peter Merkel. we look at them the same way we could also talk about these drawings that although still addressing proportion are not about a classical understanding of proportion per se. They are somehow more intuitive, more uh, of a visual reaction, I would say, of an author on a piece of paper. Or we could talk about pure rhetorics and describe how important it is to place a certain column in a certain point of a square and how much that pretty much defines a narrative for uh, the author. And in this case, in three different houses from the same architect, for different clients in different contexts with different briefs, the exercise of putting a point or marking a dot in a in a square becomes the raison d'etre of uh, the exercise or the possibility of designing a full house that is just about one space and calling it a meaning space this is also something we um, somehow appreciate a lot in this case in shinohara this idea that in sec in the second style he was pretty much working uh, his entire process was about working a single space or defining a single space as the core uh, of a house and all the other programs they were somehow playing or they were secondary actors to this main space and later on the same architect ended up discovering a new technology and a new lens in this case a new tool which was the 3d model and to understand that um, maybe because he was looking at the process from a completely different angle, he could now document it in a different way. In this case, the long exposure photo of the screen, uh, but at the same time to achieve a completely different result. So the same architect that was playing with the dot on a square in the mid 60s was playing with this kind of deconstructed geometries in the late 80s. Um, and at the same time to, to we, we like to spread our, let's say, our field of references um, to names that are less obvious many times. We like to bring together what we could call high architecture and low architecture, 
we like to enjoy the things we like and we don't feel the need to justify why we appreciate a certain author or why we do not appreciate a very obvious author many times also. And one of the architects we learn to, to truly enjoy is uh, Takefumi Aida with his many different uh, representations also. And I, if today you would like me to talk about representation, I would leave as an Easter egg this idea. Google Takefumi Aida, his work is one of those hidden gems that most architects today don't know about. And I would argue is much more relevant than we are. So I would focus on his work. Um, and other times to just look at a single drawing. This is a house by Pitagawara, a house that I know very little about other than this drawing, but I just don't need any more than this. Like, can a drawing per se, not a collage, an actual drawing done with a pen, with paper, with pencil, uh, become almost, uh, the, let's say, the climax of a career of an architect? And in the case of Pitagawara, I could almost argue, yes, that's exactly the case. This drawing is the most relevant element he ever produced, and today it impacts our production tremendously, more than many other architects who produced millions and millions of square meters. Um, and I would like to move from this idea that we look at these parallel readings, at these, at these authors and at these uh, references uh, to our production. How does this apply uh, to our projects? Taking as an example a small factory refurbished a few years ago, uh, and I must say this was a clothing factory that looked like a house because the original uh, owner said that uh, he believed that this way it would fit better in its context. Um, but more important, uh, it was for us to understand that the plan had a, a mistake that was caused by the fact that the structural axis of the building was not in the axis of the building. It was actually off-center. And this came, this, this happened just because the machines inside, they require two different lengths. So big machines on the bottom, small machines above. And the first and foremost uh, important uh, discovery or let's say invention in this case of this project was to understand the grid that we could define on the plan. And by dividing the plan in two sides, two symmetrical sides uh, that are aligned with the structural axis and introducing a couple of exceptions, we managed to produce the whole narrative of the plan to spread the program exactly where we needed it and somehow to redefine the facade by, let's say, extruding this plan towards the vertical surfaces. And in the end, um, the space is very dry, it's very, I would say, very clean, almost very clinical, but it is the obvious answer to a not so obvious problem we found in the plan, which was the lack of logic or the, the lack of um, um, reason uh, on the distribution of the structural axis. And of course, if that happens, we celebrate that axis, we celebrate that mistake by not incorporating it on the wall, but actually by detaching it, by leaving it in front of the white wall and somehow celebrating its existence. So the mistake we found as a start becomes, again, uh, the raison d'etre of the, of the living spaces of this house. And I took that project as an example, so this, uh, this factory that became a housing block, but why could I could apply the same principle on pretty much any of the other any of the other plans or of any of the other projects? We like to draw these plans always in the same way. There's a black line that defines a perimeter, there's a yellow line that defines a metric, and then there's blue lines defining rules and red lines defining exceptions. So to take an example in full, there's the square that defines the context of this house. So there's an inside of the square and there's an outside of the square. There's two alignments that suggest certain circulation axes. There are four quadrants, three of them occupied, one of them remains empty, and then two of those quadrants have intersections, uh, in this case a diagonal at 45 degrees and a quarter of a circle. And by doing that and introducing the column that seems to be in the center of the space while you are in the room, but it's actually off-centered, to help emphasize in this grid, you define the composition of that living room. And of course, on top of this, there's a lot of proportions and metrics so that everything somehow matches. Um, but the final plan, although I would say no one cares about this, no one besides us is actually deeply disturbed by the fact that the column could or could not be fully aligned with this invisible grid. But to us, it is really important. And it is fundamental that when we design this plan, when we somehow 
propose this building even if someone else in this case the client the promoter the person that is going to inhabit the house does not care about these rules that these rules still exist even if for nothing else for ourselves um, and here we have the, the, some images of the house that is currently still under construction um, and you see the column that is celebrated and the column of this house is the column on the left here and you can see that that column stops just a few centimeters before touching the ceiling and this is important because this column is there has a spatial element has a let's say an architectonical device it's a device that helps to separate the living from the dining area or in this case the cooking area the kitchen from the living room and as such it's not a column that is necessary for structural reasons so by touching the ceiling it would somehow suggest that we as uh, the authors were not able to properly solve the structure because the first reading anyone has of a column is a column is here to hold a building because unfortunately in the last century columns were somehow taken over by engineering and they stopped being architectural devices if you think about michelangelo most of his columns were not holding anything they were just uh, devices uh, at the disposal of the architectural expression and this is a column that is somehow doing exactly that and by lowering it a few centimeters it becomes um, a question mark for any visitor why is that column there what is that column trying to achieve that column is just dividing two spaces therefore it doesn't touch the ceiling and on the right we have a completely different project where the whole living space is just one big square and the column is placed at the exact geometrical center of the room and the pavement in wood somehow gravitates around it so that it can define four different spaces one for the bed one for the table one for the sofa one for the kitchen um, and the two projects are represented in these interior elevations in different abstract manners. If the left one is somehow celebrating all the different geometrical um, gestures that compose the living space, the one on the right is just about one line in front of one wall with two doors. And if you look at the plans, they share something in common. There is a certain approach to the square, a certain approach to the central element where, although on the left side, on the plan of the house, the column is actually not in the center, but seems like it. On the right side, we have four columns. On the floor above, they are exactly in the center of the squares. On the floor below, because of the corridor wall, they are not physically and visible in, in a visible way in the center of the room but they are actually in the center of the square in the plan which is the rhetorical side that we care the most about and again we could see how the grid uh, for example in this case is also celebrated on the house on the right with five columns along the corridor that somehow mark the grid that otherwise would not be perceivable on that very long longitudinal space um, and this brings us to a discussion about columns uh, we love columns we think columns are probably one of the best uh, architectural ingredients we could use in order to uh, produce architectural rhetorics. But columns, as I said, they were taken over by engineering in the last century and they stopped being architectural devices. So every time we have the chance, we celebrate columns. We detach them from the walls. We somehow make them non-structural if possible. And we many times even impose columns in spaces that don't need them precisely because we want them to be an architectural device long before they are structural devices. And for example, this is a this is a house. We this is a project we finished a few weeks ago, where this old eighteenth um, nineteenth century house was refurbished and transformed several times along the the centuries and um, the clients asked us now to completely you know let's let's press the reset button and we want to transform it now so that it's not transformed again of course you know that's what happened 50 years ago and 50 years before that point but in this case uh, the whole plan gravitates around one central column a column that is actually a chimney a chimney that actually takes the smoke from the fireplace in the center of the living room to the roof outside but it is a column that somehow works as a, let's say, um, vertical connector of all the levels that although geometrically decomposed and playing on many different uh, geometrical forms uh, are all somehow still depending on that column. Every single wall, every single door is somehow gravitating towards that central element. 
or in the nemesis of that house, uh, a house that is literally no form. It's a simple rectangle built from scratch with rooms that are just very sad parallel rectangles, but that has a column at its core, at its center, that again receives all the doors, that again becomes the, let's say, the node, the focal point of the whole plan. And when we put the two side by side, they have, they seem a bit like uh, weird versions of one another because one has a column that um, is not formal, is a perfect rectangle, a perfect square actually, and all the walls are somehow um, expressive and formal. And on the other side, on the right side, we have a plan that has a pretty much no form, it's very dry, and then the column itself is a very formal object. But both of them have this, uh, this kind of uh, punchline. If the one on the right touches the floor, but it's not a column, it's a chimney, so it goes over the, the ceiling in order to take the smoke away. The one on the right is actually just not, it's not a structural column, it's just a column that is necessary on the top two levels to hold the door, so it works almost as a camp carpentry device. And on the living room, it helps dividing the living space from the dining space, and as it's not a structural column, it gravitates a few centimeters above the floor. So if on the column on the left, as I said, you have a square that all the doors depend on. On the one on the right, you have a very formal device that all the doors run away from. So the non-formal column of the left allows you to never perceive it as an object because you always have a door somehow that does not let you see around it. But the one on the right uh, has the doors opening in the complete opposite direction precisely so that one could see the object per se. So one could see the shape, the only formal device on the whole house as a piece per se. And when you look at the perspective they have from inside the living spaces, I'm gonna argue they are not that different in the end. I mean, we could discuss the rest of the materials on the two houses, but mostly the relation between the doors and the columns always make them kind of discrete in a way. But when we are uh, facing them uh, on site, they become very different objects. The one on the left, it's clearly holding doors together. So the one on the left is the one that truly becomes a carpentry device of sorts. The one on the right becomes a very proud, uh, heavy object um, in the center at the heart of a house. And in any case, in both of the in both of these projects, we felt the need to to express the the whole intention of the project around this kind of let's say this 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 um, this line this this column that stabs the building from top to bottom, from the top from the ground floor to the ceiling, and holds together the narrative of the different floors. And this is, for example, another project where that I showed images of before that talks about facade and about, you know, the, the, let's say the plastic expression of the building towards the urban space, towards the city. But that on the inside, on the left side, you can see in pink the five levels of the house and in gray the different columns that actually grab it together. So there are differences on the plan, there are different typological arrangements from floor to floor. But these structural columns, that in this case are actually structural, they somehow bring it all together. So although these are different houses from different people, because these are actually five apartments, it is very important for us that these um, structural elements bring the house together as one, um, bring the building together as one, as one entity. And I'm going to go through this. I showed this before. Um, and before I also talked about this idea of um, the elevations as individual entities, as if each building, you know, each facial expression um, deserves its own, its own space, its own pink background. Um, but taking, for example, a facade that is made as a canvas, um, we pretty much could summarize this, this process of composition as a additive process, as a very flat process. So the way how we build a collage like Randy was talking about in the beginning, is not very different from the way how we uh, do, for example, uh, an inner elevation or an exterior elevation or something. So we just add elements. We had the crown that is a concrete beam that is exposed to crown the building to end the roof. We had the base that is just a series of white and black dots defining a kind of shoe. We have the chimney that is a bit taller than actually necessary. 
we have the column that is a bit hot centered we have the door that is definitely taller than it needs to be the big window for the living room the small window for the kitchen and when we have all of this together for us it makes perfect sense and it's very important that the square window is actually aligning at the axis of the building that the height of the column is half of the height of the building that the top of the door aligns with the top of the circle the height of the chimney is the height of the door so there's a lot of rules too many rules i would even say but the process is a process is an ad additive process in this case that every addition solves a specific problem but in the end it is just one facade it's just the face of the building and it needs to make sense as a single piece and as we gravitate around the building we could see the other facades and we would understand how much they are actually all part of the same family there's one facade that is somehow expressing the chimney another one that is expressing the the roof another one is expressing the beam and then there's the last one that is not expressing anything in particular um, and this idea of playing with compositional facades as something we have been playing a lot since the beginning of our practice because many of the buildings we or many of the projects we did so far they are renovations transformations adaptations and in most of those cases you already have a let's say a body to work in you know there's already a building on site there's already something you you can work with and due to a let's say a more or less sad set of regulations we are many times forced to keep or preserve the um, the public expression of the building so uh, if if we are operating on an old building we somehow need to keep it looking old so we cannot change it that much but the back facades are many times not protected or i would almost say all the times not protected so we can do anything we want with them so what ends up happening is that uh, in the vast majority of the projects we did so far the back facade is the main facade of our architecture and the fact that in most of these cases this back facade as you see on the right side um, is actually facing just a private garden does not change the fact that it is the main facade and the fact that the facade on the left is an existing facade that was just retouched refurbished and it's facing a public space does not give it the right to be the main facade of all the project in our eyes and in this case this is our office so this is actually where i am now i'm sitting here right next to this window um, and you can see the street facade that is a building from the late 30s with the kind of hybrid construction between concrete and granite and so on it is a very nice old facade that's one of the reasons why we respected it so much we just added uh, the top hat you know on the top um, and the back facade is actually the main facade of the building and it expresses exactly what a building is it has three levels the bottom level it's public it's the office and the two levels above is where me Anne, and Ahmed live um, and it has a residential feeling the black dot at the end ends the composition and somehow finishes the facade on the inside it has a lot of more points in common for example these are similar perspectives of different levels on the left you have Ahmed's apartment with a double door that includes a door for the cat um, to go to the living room and the window to the kitchen and on the right side uh, the office space without any furniture as you see the proportion the way how the photo is taken the relation between the floor and the beam is pretty much the same but uh, these are two different spaces one is residential the other one is the office and in this case you have a photo of the three levels and in the three levels you have a pink element in each of them a different element on the ground floor the office you have the big door to the garden on the middle level you have the double pattern door uh, from Ahmed's living room and on the top level there's just a very thin line of the handrail in our lobby um, and in all of them you also have the same pavement and in all of them you have white walls and in all of them you have the same door and in all of them you have a concrete element somehow uh, doing the counterpart of the pink uh, the pink moment um, and this is the project as we see it so although it, it's one of the hardest and most fragmented projects we did so far and the only project we did for ourselves so far also which might have something in common um, it is in our eyes a very consistent piece of architecture um, and this is this is uh, another comprehensive drawing of um, a building we did a few years before where a very small house in the city center had to be transformed into a series of apartments and here you can see how the different elements come together there's a curve there's a pattern that seems to be on the floor there's a few 
color door. Some are green, some are pink. There's a couple of mirrors here and there. There's a line that continues all the way to the outside. And most important, there's the facade, the mask that finishes the, the composition. So when you actually go inside the spaces, you understand that the same stepped wall that goes up and works as a shelf on the floor below somehow hides the hood on the kitchen of the floor above. The curved wall on the left uh, becomes the curved ceiling above. The door of the apartment on the left is pink, but on the photo on the right is green. So somehow with the same set of ingredients, we try to produce the biggest amount or the, the, the most richness uh, possible. Uh, or in other projects where there's almost uh, um, the need to isolate what we could call the, 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 the geometry from the space and the surfaces from the plan. And when we actually looked at these different apartments, so this is a project with six houses, four of them follow one rule, two are exceptional. The same materiality tries to hold on together different spatial conditions, even if we are talking about houses that have less than 15 square meters of footprint. So these are very, very small houses with very limited spatial possibilities that indeed we try to um, somehow contradict um, by introducing double height spaces and a very rich material palette to give to the final space the same richness one could see and envision on the collage uh, years before. And on the top level, under the very, under the sloped roof, uh, you have this kind of weird moments where the, let's say the bedroom is the result of all the decisions that were made before um, for the social spaces. Or um, another example of a project that is made out of accepting uh, the regulation and accepting the volume we had to preserve. So in this case, a very old factory volume, but transforming it into housing. And by introducing the maximum amount of apartments, because this is a promoter project, this is a project that is meant to be profitable. That does not mean it does not have to be a proper architecture project. Sometimes people assume that if you do one, you cannot do the other. We don't believe that. We believe it's perfectly possible to achieve both. So the plan, and by looking at the plan, one can easily see the repetition, the greed, the monotony of the imposition from the, the brief. But at the same time, by playing with a section, by understanding uh, the regulations that the municipality cares about, but more importantly, the regulations the municipality does not care about, one can end up with 15 apartments that are exactly the same, but are all exactly the opposite. So let's say by keeping the same ingredients, the same colors, the same materiality, but changing the spatial qualities of each of them by playing with a section, one ends up, one ends up not with 15 times the same thing, but actually 15 different things. And this was the main goal. And why not applying the same principle to the bathrooms also? So both. The 15, so this is a project with 15 studios. So there's 15 living spaces and 15 bathrooms. So 30 rooms in total, and we have 30 different outputs uh, from this process. And if one tries to do a storyline, if one tries to do this kind of uh, comparison of perspectives, it's very easy to see that there's a lot in common, but if, we, if one pays attention, we will understand that there are not two that have the same perspective in the end. Um, and uh, we also like, as I said in the beginning, to, to gravitate between different, different lenses and different tools. And by moving to the collage, it's even easier to understand the impact that the texture of the ceiling is going to have and how much the ceiling is going to impact or not the perception of the inner space and how much the simple moving of a window or the simple detachment of a door or the blue cabinet will impact the perception of the, or will somehow oppose the perception of the inner room. Um, and other times, why not doing a project that is 20 times the same room? So the complete opposite of what I said now. So imagine a house. A house suggests hierarchy. A house suggests main living spaces, secondary living spaces, circulation spaces, private spaces. But why not trying to achieve a house where all the spaces have no hierarchy? And this is a house we have now under construction in Lisbon where we are attempting at that. So all the rooms have exactly the same ceiling height, the same floor, the same windows. And one way or another, they become the same room. And to us, it's very important to see these two projects together in the sense that they, it's not like if one is right and the other one is wrong. They are just different ideas in both cases taken all the way to the limit. And you see the plan in this case, it's a very dry plan. There's a central staircase and there's a program on the left, a program on the right. The bathrooms, they find their space 
on the on the neighbor walls and with very small kinks and exceptions we make the program work but more importantly if we take 200 photos of the building i showed before anyone will be able to recognize exactly which room is being documented if you take 200 photos of this building you don't know which room you're looking at at any point and in order to somehow uh, let's say to 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 cut the, the 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 seriousness of that moment on the last floor there's a dome and that dome connects the kitchen and the living space so although they are exactly the same they have a curved ceiling um, but a facade for a project like this is a facade that needs to be at least half as aggressive as the idea for the plan is. And in this case, we made a facade that is twice as aggressive. So by playing with split levels and by playing with two windows on each room, so one touching the floor and one touching the ceiling, we end up doubling the amount of windows we actually need and disguising completely the actual scale of the building. So it's a very small house with a very important and proud facade. We, we call it the house of countless windows because it has way too many windows, but the windows are too small in comparison to what is traditional or expected. So in a way or another, one cannot really understand how big or small or what is this house? What is this house all about? So the facade works as a mask and the mask is applied both in the front and in the back so one cannot really perceive which room is documenting and when photographing the facades one cannot really perceive if it's the front or the back of a building because they are exactly the same um, or in another case in the suburbs from porto where we are building this is the biggest building we have under construction at this moment where by definition or by necessity i would say we had to build a maximum um, volume possible because again this is a promoter project it's a project that is meant to be profitable and we had to build a maximum amount of apartments but by doing a big box that does not mean we cannot project an image on it and what if we end up with five apartments and we see all of them from the street but if we start counting we have six rows of windows we have four doors we have five pink dots and five black triangles we have two drain pipes uh, it's, it's, it's kind of unclear where each house starts and ends there's also a kind of very light chessboard pattern on the plaster so to explain this I have to start by saying that there's the plaster there's the crown that finishes the building there's the windows six of them there's the balconies six of them but then there's the triangles five large two short there's a small piece of black stone on top of the bottom floor window so that suddenly the facade is all made out of uh, suspended um, suspended elements from the crown there's the doors and the doors for some reason they are the first element that does not respect at all the rules of the facade so they somehow completely cut and break uh, all the systems that are um, overimposed already but then the pink dots they go on top of the doors so they again force some sort of system then there are two rain pipes placed in apparently random places and of course the shutters that will produce the randomness that was necessary on the vertical axis and when we look at the project we understand that this facade that is trying to disguise the six houses or sorry the five houses in a facade with six windows actually is a system that goes all around the building so you see the footprint of the building is a bit weird it's a footprint that comes 100 percent from the regulations and the maximum square meterage you can see on the top level plan that it's based on the repetition of the same bedroom several times there are these five columns that repeat the five pink dots on the facade that try to bring the building together as one but once one looks at the building from an exterior perspective it's not perceivable where it starts where it ends where my property ends and your property begins and it's in a very funny stage of construction so one sees more or less the skeleton of the building on site there's already some of the black stone there's already a bit of the chessboard pattern it's in this it's in a beautiful moment i would say it's it's a very nice opportunity for us to visit and to document a building of this scale which uh, in our practice is still somehow uh, novelty and again the rules that define the plan where you can see the yellow lines defining the grid the blue lines defining the rule the green lines defining proportion 
but more important, the pink lines define exceptions. And what is ironic in this is that the less important spaces in this plan, so the bathrooms, the pantries, you know, the storage spaces, are the ones introducing the exception to the rule. So therefore, all the formal expressionism of the inner volumes of these houses comes from the least relevant and small scale projects. Um, and by introducing those five columns that uh, we saw before, we saw them in the photo in the beginning and we saw them on the drawing just now, we operate uh, this kind of miracle where the same elements, again, the same pavement, the same ceiling, the same door, the same wall, so there's no diversity in that sense, uh, repeat each other several times, but the only element that is constantly in the same place is the column. Everything else changes, everything else gravitates around it because of these exceptions of the bathrooms, the curves of the pantries, etc., etc. But the column becomes the only constant. The column is, let's say, the axis of gravitation of the inner space. Uh, in these five houses. Um, and here, for example, we have two projects side by side that have, in both cases, two levels and very, very opposite uh, relations. Uh, the one on the left, it's made out of uh, two floors. The ground floor below is just a living space and it's defined by a single curve. So in both of these projects, the perimeter was given, these rectangles, they were pre-existing rectangles, let's say. And the one on the left is cut uh, longitudinally with this curved wall, and this curved wall separates circulation from living room. But above, the program is completely fragmented. So you have bathrooms, you have uh, office space, you have three bedrooms, you have a, a lobby, and all of them have a very complex geometrical relation with the programs adjacent to them. So let's say the plan on the left is actually a plan that is about opposing systems being overlapped. So we have two opposite systems being somehow forced to coexist. The plan on the right is apparently the same on both levels, but once we pay attention, we understand that the only thing that remains in the exact same place are the doors, the free doors, and all the walls actually change from the ground floor to the top floor. And it's interesting to imagine a plan where the only constant are the doors. So usually the constants are structural elements, probably non-retaining walls, but never the only constant being carpentry pieces that can move and rotate and change place. So in this case, we thought it was very interesting to imagine and to conceive a project where the columns that hold the narrative of the architecture together are actually the doors, the fragile light elements uh, every house has, but very few times celebrates. And here you see the two um, the two living spaces side by side. So on the left you have this very complex system of elements overimposed into a very simple wall. So you have different doors, you have an opening, you have a window at the end, there's a triangle under the stairs and somehow all of these are stuck, glued, copy pasted into this curved surface, uh, almost like a three-dimensional collage. But on the right side, you have just white walls and three times the same door, but because of its formal expression, it seems like it's a very erratic space. So it's interesting to see how the linear plan of the left results in a very complex elevation, and the complex plan of the right results in a very simple uh, spatial materiality composition. Um, and here you see the two elevations, as I was saying. So on the left, with a lot of elements over a simple geometry, and on the right, with a lot of geometries with simple gestures and with simple forms and simple textures. And in terms of materiality, they also play this weird game. The one on the left uh, and the one on the right, in both cases, the two projects, they grab a certain materiality that covers the whole building. So let's say on the left side, the same pavement, the same walls, the same ceiling somehow bring together the whole project and the same applies on the right, but with opposite, uh, let's say, textures. If the one on the left has this very warm wood pavement with stripes, uh, with lines, um, it has a kind of cold ceiling, so there's this slight bluish greenish tone that tries to compensate for the, the, let's say, the temperature of the floor. And on the right side, we have the opposite. We have a cold pavement, a cold stone pavement, and a square chessboard but that is compensated by a very light pink tone on the ceiling. So if we, if we would flip one of these two images upside down, we would kind of get the same, um, the same image twice, kind of. Um, and on the back facade of both of these, we have, again, a kind of uh, 
uh, antithesis of everything I said before, because the one on the left has two levels. So it has the ground floor that you remember to be completely open and simple and ends in this big window and is celebrated by a pink column. And the top level that is very complex and full of geometries and different spaces that has a white wall ending it and just a very small window framing the view. The one on the right, it has two levels, but the window of both levels is connected so that it feels like it's just one very big window. So again, you can see on the facade that the door to the garden on both levels is aligned. The window on both levels is aligned. So it's all about connecting the elements that are usually not connected on both floors. But both of them end up having this kind of fronton, this kind of striped element that crowns the composition. On the left side, to hide the traditional roof that due to the regulations we were forced to preserve. On the right side, to clearly cut the relation of our intervention to the weird uh, and not so interesting building above us because on the left side we are a full building but on the right side we are just the ground floor of a apartment block and both of them have this flying circle one crowning the crown and the other one somehow working as a handrail for the staircase um, and we see them here in context both of them we can create this uh, this narrative that we depict our elevations devoid of any context and we just give them a pink background but of course when you document and you photograph the buildings it's nice to understand how they place themselves in the context they occupy and how much they do not belong to it uh, particularly in the photo on the right it's very interesting to see how that crown uh, of the facade goes all around the garden and ends up defining a kind of oasis in the middle of this city block, um, this kind of inaccessible um, oasis uh, in the middle of the city. And this brings us back to this photo I showed before of the, the, the back facade that is the main facade. And I said uh, a bit ago that it's a main facade for private use, you know, a main facade facing a private garden, but then accidentally you can find perspectives like this where you understand that maybe a few other people might also see it might also perceive it if not in full at least partially and react to it and tell us how much they don't like it how much they say it does not belong how much uh, they actually hate it and it was very funny for us when we documented this specific facade from this specific point of view that the lady living in this house told us how much upset she was about that very unpleasant facade for her and it was very funny for us also to understand that if we ignore the facade and we make it white as in this image i would argue that everything else is unpleasant but she's fine with it it's, it's it was a it was one of the most interesting architectural discussions we had with a non-architect so far but this is reality and the facade is still there and uh, in this case we had the opportunity to recently revisit uh, the the building and to, 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 to document it again and to document how it's aging and it was very nice to see that um, the, the ivy grew and somehow took over the garden and now the, the facade is not only uh, let's say rooted in its context due to its physical weight but also nature is somehow finding a way to take over both our building and the building next to us. Um, and I would like to end uh, this, uh, this part of the presentation by showing the two first houses we built so far and built from scratch. And what is interesting about them is that they have exactly the same program and they are both perfect squares. One is a bit smaller than, than the other and you can see that they have different breeds. So the, the yellow lines we define for the orders are not necessarily always the same. On the right, we define the three quadrants and the exceptions I showed before. On the left, we have a system that has a symmetrical axis separating the living spaces from the private spaces. And the scale of the exceptions are radically different. So we have big cuts on a big square and we have small gestures on a small square. Uh, and there's a column just on the left side. Um, but when we look at the plans and when we try to finally document them uh, in terms of their elevations, we start understanding that maybe besides being squares, they have more in common. They have a crown that is a beam in concrete. They have white walls. They have square windows and round windows. They have a chimney that is somehow prominent on the left on the top and in the roof on the left on the side, somehow detached from the floor. And when we look at them from far, they're not that different in the end. They are somehow distant cousins, I would say. They are in different contexts, both of them suburban, generic, well, I would say unappealing, 
but both of them play the same game in different ways. One is smaller but higher on the right, the other one is lower but wider on the left. They are both squares, they both have the same elements, they are both part of a certain architectural discourse. And when one goes inside, we understand the distinction in the living space we were talking about. On the left side, we have a living space that is formally complex, that celebrates a certain column, that has the wood on the pavement somehow gravitating around that axis that the column defines. But on the right side, we have a very simple rectangle with a high ceiling and a sloped roof. And the, 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 the conclusion is that despite we have windows of the same size and proportion and doors with a similar detail, we have very different spatial constructions. And that's very important for us, that these two projects somehow resume or they, they present a summary of what we like to believe we do in every single project of ours, which is they always attempt at being detached, being unique, at being you know distinct from whatever preceded them, but they end up becoming part of, a, let's say, a timeline where everything is somehow connected to one another. And these are the two, the two axonometries of the beaming spaces, a little bit like those drawings from Shinohara that I showed before, but for some reason we like to show them with element scholars and pavements if necessary. So imagine a Shinohara axo where all the objects from Kitagawara had the opportunity to be uh, revealed uh, in the space. Um, and ironically, when we decided to make the comprehensive drawing for both of them, we ended up, without rationalizing it that much, um, again, relating the two of them. Each of them has the plant at the center, each of them has two elevations, each of them somehow celebrates the roof uh, as, a, as an important element. And so I would like to finish this chapter by saying that, you know, it's fundamental for us to use the plan as a starting point, the plan as a drawing that is properly drawn, a drawing that has its own rules, a drawing that somehow overimposes itself to most of the decisions that um, happen after it, um, that um, the remaining drawings, be them sections, constructive details, whatever, they are just somehow um, depending or answering to whatever the plan requests, so they come after, they are a consequence of the plan and not the other way around, but they can, of course, introduce other layers of richness to whatever the plan is attempting. So let's say the plan comes first, the section comes after, the elevation comes even after, but they all somehow uh, play together. And the elevation is, uh, in many ways, a reflection of an intention towards the city. So a facade says something about uh, public expression, it says something about uh, how to address and the urban space ahead of us, but it's also in itself a, re a reaction to a certain planet, to a certain program. So the same facade would not make sense with two different uh, with two different plants. The collage is, in a way, a systematic tool. It's a tool that allows us to create relations, parallels, distinctions. It's a tool that uh, it's impulsive in a way, like textures are exaggerated, colors, you know, the green in a collage is greener than in reality. The white is whiter, the brick is, you know, a brick is more of a brick in a collage than it would be in reality. Objects are necessary, even a giraffe makes sense. So the collage is to a certain extent the opposite of all the rhetoric I was talking about before. The collage is just that place where you go and you test the idea to make sure it actually works, that visually it will somehow respond or correspond to whatever the plan was attempting. And then the photo at the end becomes this kind of uh, summary. It's the moment where you depict from very specific standpoints with very specific frames, the production in such a way that you can later on uh, compare it. And to finish, uh, I would like to talk about what I call photographic thinking, which is um, an idea that runs through um, most of our projects without being very rationalized until today or until now. Uh, until recently, which is this idea that you can and should understand the building as two constructions. There's a construction that is the one-to-one -one scale, that is the house that will be inhabited, that will be occupied by someone. So that's one of the readings. But in parallel, there's also the building that is the mental construction of the architect. And the project should be a mental construction before being anything else. And we as architects need to produce a narrative around our work that somehow 
the photograph manages to express probably better than the building itself because the photograph has also the power of condensation. So in a single image to say a lot. So to be able to put a lot of information in a certain angle, in a certain set of colors, in a certain uh, light mood. And these are four photos by four uh, different architects. Uh, three of them are not our buildings. Uh, one of them is our building on the, right, on the right. But you see, they have in common the fact that they are depicting entrance points, that they are more or less taken from the same angle, that they are both you know, kind of wrong in terms of perspective. They are not really frontal or really from the side. They are a bit tilted just. But we like to put the four of them together because I think that that kind of wrong perspective uh, benefits tremendously all of them. And when we see them side by side, we understand that for one reason or another, maybe these photographers they didn't talk with each other, they didn't discuss these specific photos together, but they ended up doing the same thing um, in different times and places and with different buildings. And one of the things we started doing recently was to go back to all of these photos and to understand the books we have on the bookshelf and to try to understand if we did not do these projects in a way that uh, reflects something that the photographers were capable to depict and to register on a photograph that we have not yet seen somewhere else. So what if, um, let's say, the, the, the architecture we produced is somehow trying to uh, do an homage trying to uh, applaud, let's say, the heroes of the past that we often look up to, because it is, I mean, we don't deny it. We believe in architecture made out of precedent, architecture that, an architecture that is truly depending on the heroes we studied, the, 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 the whatever heroes they were. But it is also true that, as I said before, most of the architecture we consume today is an architecture that is given to us via photographs, via um, publications, via um, websites and lectures. So it's an architecture that we did not witness, that we did not perceive in full as a building. So it's an architecture of that second parallel reading I was talking about. So maybe uh, when we put ourselves on that second level, on that second reading, we might find much more meaning in the production we have than if we just try to compare the buildings with the buildings that make no sense to be compared about. And by doing this, this exercise of putting these photos side by side, on the left, there's always a photo from a building or a photographer that is a hero of ours. And on the right, there's a building and a photo of one of our projects. Um, we managed to understand that maybe there's more in common to them than just the architectural ideas. There is just a certain critical thinking that comes from the photographer to the, via, from, the, from the architect to the work via the photographer. So we like to, uh, this is a very recent, um, I was telling Randy, it's the first time we are presenting this collection of images. This is a very recent study or research we are conducting, looking back at certain photographers, mostly at Kojitaki, um, who was actually a philosopher that photographed a series of buildings from um, Kazuo Shinohara, and trying to understand uh, how much was there. Uh, for example, in this case, is a building from Toyoito on the left, and the, the, the perspective on the right is not matching. So it's not a matter of perspective, but if you actually consider all the gestures and movements and the way how the photo is taken slightly tilted, it's exactly the two photos in our eyes, they are trying to say the same thing. But even with the same photo for our building, we could also try to find another project that is playing the same game of lightness and the same game of abstraction. Um, or is it a matter of perspective and lightness? Of course, the handrails from Itsuko Asegawa are very different from ours, but they are just playing the same game. And the way how she depicts this, almost this fear of falling in this very lightweight project is not very far away from one another. Or the house in Seijo, from, from Shinohara again, with that very tall lamp coming all the way down, we could not see a way to avoid relating it to that very, very thin red line of the lamp in our photo. And as we, as we did these comparisons, uh, it became more and more clear that we do not know how to rationalize it. We do not know exactly, let's say, what we are trying to say when we compare these images and when you compare these buildings but we believe that we are looking at something that makes sense 
uh, in our eyes. And as I said, this is the first time we are presenting it. This is an ongoing study. This is something we are trying to, to, to further, um, let's say, develop on a conceptual basis. But it ends up with this idea from Kojitaki that is called anti-architectural photography. At some point, the second reading from Taki was taken so far that magazines and publications of its time refused to publish his works because, in their words, the photos were not presenting architecture. The photos were presenting some sort of metaphysical dimension of the project that was not commercial, that was not somehow expressing what the building was as a building, as a series of rooms, as a house, as a program. And uh, this is something that attracts us a lot. Of course, this is a very dangerous thing to say, that we are running away from what a house should be. And we don't believe we should do a house that is not a house. I, I don't think one thing excludes the other. It's not a matter of either or. But I think it's very important And when we do the first reading, you know, the house, the volume, the one-to-one -one scale, we manage to keep the second reading. And that's why we try to understand now from a very critical standpoint, it's not praising it, but is this an anti-architectural photography what we are doing? Therefore, is this the same thing that Kojitaki was doing? And I think the answer is no, I don't think so. But there's something in common also. So let's say that there's, although from a different angle and with probably different tools and maybe with very different motivations because the context is different, let's say that the projects are different, we are still looking for something in common. And uh, maybe in the, in the upcoming years, we're gonna find out exactly how far or how close we were um, of having similar interests or actually trying to achieve the same thing. Um, and this is the last slide. Um, this is a quote from a text that Tibor Gianelli wrote um, about her work that was probably one of the most compelling um, presentation, uh, one of the most compelling um, remarks uh, on our production, which is that Besides the, 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 the project itself, there's this kind of raster that goes vertically through all the floors, through all the plants, that gives um, a profound resonance that, that goes beyond the, the, the surfaces. And this is what we would like to end up with. That there's indeed a one-to-one -one scale, there's the collage, there's the building, but there's a second layer. There's this raster that is as important for us as that first reading. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, thank you, Philip. Um, what a presentation. Still amazed. So, sorry. It was the first okay. time I did this presentation and I tried to say it all. So mostly the last chapter, the photographic thinking, it was a kind of improvisation in situ. So I hope, mm -hmm. uh, I hope it was not too boring. Well, no, that, that was the, the most interesting part of the presentation because it's like, a, I, was, I was making some notes that's always something that you always mention, you know, and I, I could a little bit um, conclude something with, with every approaches that you did. I mean, the composition, the color palette, I just opened the Pantone, the, the Pantone website and it has that artist, same exactly colors that supposed to be belongs to each other and also the memento. I mean, you, you always put at least one, uh, one or two elements as, as, as the, you know, as, as the character, as the, this one column or one chimney is, is like the finishing touch. And all of those are totally make sense with, the, with that photographical uh, part of presentation on the end. Um, and you, you are also mentioned like this word like homage. The hom it is okay to, 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 to give the respect to our heroes, right? I mean, by, by not copying, of course, but to give the same sense, to give the same breathe. I mean, I, I, I also discussed with my friends here. Uh, it's all, almost the same. What you did is almost the same with, with with the movies of Quentin Tarantino, for example. I, I'm giving the example of movies. I, I've seen one video of Tarantino that, that how he collaged many movies into his movies. I mean, many classical movies into his movies. Only the sense, only the breeze, only the passage. 
it's like that, but, but it feels the same, but it's not actually copying. So when you, when you put those photographical between, between your work and Koji Taki's, uh, sorry, Koji Taki's photographer uh, works, is actually the same sense, but, but not exactly the same uh, shape or, 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 or image. So was it, that was amazed me. So again, thanks I mean, for I, I can give you, I can give you, I can give you an example. Like when I showed, I showed yes. two drawings, um, one from Shinohara, is axonometric mm -hmm. of the main space completely empty and this is a drawing we know mm -hmm. for a long time this is something that we knew before we even built any project and it's it's a drawing or a series of drawings that attracts us a lot this idea that you can extract from a house the main space that is more important than all the other spaces and it's usually not even the living room or anything like that it's just a circulation entrance space that is very very meaningful and then I presented a drawing after from Kitagawara that has this axo of the house with no spaces and yeah. you just see the many important elements detached. This drawing we found out much later. So we found out that drawing from Kitagawara maybe a few months ago. And what is interesting, and it doesn't stop surprising us, is that we were looking probably at the same precedents as Kitagawara. We have been probably looking at the same kind of heroes and architects they were also and without knowing him and we ended up producing that kind of game where he talked about the column and the door that is detached and is in front or is a contrast element but what is interesting for us is to discover Kitagawara a posteriori because it would be very easy as you said to just take a reference and do exactly the same thing uh, from the start but it didn't happen like that and for example there's this very beautiful publication on kojitaki that was published um, just a couple of months ago compiling the hidden photographies the, the photographies that were never published of his and when we bought that book it was the most expensive book i ever bought to be <laughs> to be honest when we bought that book it was just like boom like this is not possible what we have been trying to do this kind of weird perspective this attempt he did before it's like and those were the photos we did not have access to so it's kind of interesting and that's why we started building that that conclusion on the pdf what if there's something that we never discussed you know we cannot discuss it with taki he passed away already so what if there is something that in completely different contexts and time and geographies interested us both and or maybe we are actually receiving all the interest he had at this time via third parties and we don't know and we are actually just somehow doing an homage to taki the whole time without even knowing we are doing an homage to taki and everything we do it's 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 a very interesting place to be in to be rediscovering these these references and to go deeper and deeper in them and to somehow understand well actually there's of course it's not taki that is inspired by us one way or another we're going to conclude that we were inspired by taki but not on a conscious manner so I think it's much more interesting um, like this. That's, why, what, what, that's what you said about why photography is quite metaphysic expression, right? It's the metaphysical feelings of expression, which is very nice. Okay, Philip, I'm going to open the discussion to the audiences. There is the first question from Awalia Dewi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask, are you presenting this collage to the clients too? If yes, how they interpret it? As we know, if the clients maybe have different way of seeing it, how do you communicate with them? We present everything. I mean, the answer to your question is yes, we are, but we also present everything else. So we present a lot of 3D models, a lot. Like sometimes we even just send a link with 50 images inside. We present a lot of plans, a lot of drawings and plans that are sometimes very nicely drawn with the construction and so on. And sometimes plans that are just lines. Sometimes we even share print screens. Like we do a print screen, we do some sketches on Photoshop on top and we just send them. Many times we even just pick something and we show on the screen like this, just like to point. <laughs> uh, when we have the collage, we show the collage. When we have a physical model, we, we show a physical model. It's, it's not a, and there are also clients that never saw a collage. And there are also clients that never saw a model and clients that never saw a 3D. It's, it's part of the process. And if it's necessary in the process, if it naturally happens, yes. What we do not do is to force the need to invent a collage for a project where we did not do one just to show it to the client. This is to a collage or any other tool. That's stupid. That's not the point. The point is if you do something that is important in the process, use it as a process. Don't 
don't let, let's say embellish process just so that it looks nicer. Is, is there any advantage, I mean, for using this collage instead of making the realistic rendering, for example? I mean, is, Again, is there, is there any advantages? You see, you see that's, that's the danger of the question. You're asking the question as an either or, like you do this instead of doing that. And I'm answering, no, we do both. I think that when you do, when you do a, at least at the er, at early stages of the project, when you mm. don't have your idea sufficiently defined, it's better to do a representation, both in drawing and in collage and in photomontage, that is a bit, let's say, undefined. That is a bit gray. So it's neither black, it's not white, it's kind of in between. Because if you are measuring, the, let's say, the, the, the power of an idea or the reception of that idea, if you show up with a very defined image that already has the right colors, all the right textures, the, the, the handles and so on, that thing is going to be like too much of a compromise. It will probably not be good for the discussion. And we will be discussing that specific image. We will not be discussing the idea. So it is very important when you do radical projects and we try, well, within the limited projects we do because we are not building museums or anything like that, but within the very normal and realistic projects we do, we like that the people that we work with, our clients, the promoters, you know, whoever asks us for a project, understand to a certain extent what we are trying to do. And most of the times we achieve that. So we manage to have a discourse that is at the same level and we talk about architecture as if we were talking with architects. And that's amazing. Sometimes we have to simplify the discourse. It's natural. Not everyone is interested. Other times, and unfortunately it also happens often, clients don't care about architecture. So we just say things like, this is beautiful, we don't show anything and we move on with our lives. I was just saying that the fact that if a client cares about architecture, we care about mm -hmm. architecture also. If a client does not care about the project, we care. So we mm -hmm. always care. And I would argue that it's much nicer when someone on the other side also cares and the discourse is much more horizontal and we somehow uh, exchange ideas and the project grows from that. But I could also argue that there's huge advantages in a client that doesn't care at all because you do whatever you want. Like that facade I showed with these marble stripes, green and black and white, it comes out of a client that just told us, yeah, do anything you want. And it was amazing for us because maybe, maybe we would have not done that facade if the client was very imposing and so on. But I don't think, again, I don't think render defeats collage or vice versa. And I don't think a client that is extremely present defeats a client that is absent. I think to a large extent, what matters is you as the author need to be the one somehow choosing how we want to address the narrative of that project and how you want to address the narrative of all of your projects. So is this a collection of individual pieces completely autonomous from one another? One week is blue, the other week is red, the other week is orange? Or is this somehow a project in connection where there are cables connecting all of them and somehow they are just one big project with many different feet? I don't know. I like more the second. Let's move to another question from Ungun. Ungun. Would you like to speak directly to Philip? Everyone okay. is very shy. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Someone already there. Uh, yes. Just the audio. Okay. Uh, thanks, Philippe, for the presentation. Um, it's it's great that you somehow um, invent your own notational graphical language uh, for your creative process. Um, uh, it's it's really great, but. Um, the question that I have in mind is uh, where where to stop when to stop the, the the exploration that the process the design process that you are doing uh, what's the what's the moment that that your your team or you say that it's it's yes this is the final this is the the end of the narrative this is the 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 conclusion of the rhetoric or yes um yeah, the, where to stop, when to stop, what's stopping you, who's stopping you. And yeah, that's my curiosity. I mean, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, and it has many answers. So there are many, let's say, there are many things stopping us since the beginning because there's a lot of limitations. There's the brief. So if you are asked for a house, you don't design a museum. There's the budget. If you only have 100,000, you don't have 1 million. 
uh, there's the regulations and the regulations, you know, the building regulations are very specific. So you can also not build. There's also gravity. Gravity is a huge limitation. Buildings do not fly. That's, that's also a constant. So I would say all of those things, they are taken for granted since the beginning. And so they are not topics. So we just accept if this is what we have, this is what we play with. And many times we sacrifice creativity or radicality because of under, we understand quite well already these limitations. But to fully answer your question, which is not about these pragmatic limitations, but about the, the let's call it artistic ones, um, I would say it only ends on the day we take the photos. To me, it has every single project has a bit that feeling that only on the day we finish taking the last photo and we store the camera, it's over. Now it ended. Until that point, the second layer does not exist. Because that's the last moment we produced anything. That's, you know, like until the last moment on construction, we can paint a wall. Until the last moment on construction, the client can show up and change something. Until the last moment, you know, when the cabinetry arrives, something can go wrong. When you take the photos, it's over. Now, now you know, if there's a, a, a meteor that lands on the building and destroys it, it existed for one second, it was registered, and it will exist on that parallel level forever. And this happens with a lot of buildings. You know, we do a lot of temporary architecture, pavilions, uh, exhibition design, stuff like that. In projects that are meant to last a few weeks, sometimes a few months, sometimes a couple of days. And when we do these projects, they only exist forever as an image. And you have a lot of projects like this along, along history. The Philips Pavilion from Corbusier is a great example of that. Like everyone knows that pavilion, no one ever been there. It's like, a, it's, a, it's a metaphysical project in that sense. Um, but I would say that the artistic side ends at 90% when we start construction. So many times we would love that the construction just follows and nothing changes and everything remains steadily the same, which is not true. We know in construction, things change a lot. The contractor changes, the client changes, the budget changes. <laughs> so we need to adapt. So I would say 90% of it ends on the day we just deliver the construction documents and 10% missing ends on the day we take the photos because those 10% can many times change, change a lot the project. Yes, yes, very clear, yes. So um, the reality becomes the image and the image become the tools and the image become the end in itself. So. In a way, yes, in a way, yes. Yeah. And I mean, to, to, to prove my point, I just presented, I don't know, 20 projects and you have not visited any of them. So to a large extent, this metaphysical side of architecture is exactly that, metaphysical. It is not palpable. Um, but it's also not the celebration of the image uh, per se, because we also have on, 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 the first le on the first level, right? We have a relation with the clients, we visit the buildings, the buildings sometimes they leak for a reason or another, or they have a crack or stuff like that. So we remain to a certain extent involved. Many times we have clients with whom we do two or three projects. So let's say the, 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 the first layer of the first project has an impact on the second and third and fourth projects. And many times, as I was also saying now with the photography thing, um, a few years later, we find out that that project and that other project, they were actually related, even if when we did both of them, we had no idea that was the case. So, well, if I can revise my answer, I could say like, no project is still finished, I would say. Maybe, maybe we will find more slides for a presentation on a specific project in five years from now when we discover that we think we invented something and then we find out exactly the same reference somewhere else? I don't know. Yes, the, the image becomes uh, the, the living organism. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. Okay. That's all I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Paundi. I just realized it was you. <laughs> uh, we move to Geraldo Lewa. He's apologizing because internet is bad. I can speak to audio. Okay. Geraldo Lewa. Thank you, Felipe, for the presentation. I would like to ask, how do you, how do your specific design elements, such as color, column, geometry, tectonics, etc., speak to the historical context of Portuguese architecture? Thanks in advance. They don't. Okay. But no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm gonna develop. No, it's um, it's not a topic for us. Like, if um. I give you an example. If we go to refurbish a building, that is a very nasty building, not an historical building, you know, completely generic. 
but it has a beautiful door or a beautiful column or a beautiful window, we will try to preserve it. But if we go to a building that is fantastic, it's a beautiful building with beautiful plastered ceilings with a lot of this old um, reliquiary, but we don't feel that reliquiary is helping the project, we remove it. So our relation with the local history is a bit the same. It's not about being local history. If there's something that has a potential to be preserved, explored, you know, expanded, we will do that in a project. Otherwise, we have no problem in just erasing whatever we find. One of the things we like the most to do is actually the demolition phase, where we just remove everything we don't want from a, a site or a construction or a renovation, and we keep just the elements we're going to preserve. It's a little bit like that drawing from Kitagawa again. It's that idea that you remove everything and then just keep the few things that are worth keeping. Of course, this depends on the project. If you build something from scratch, this does not apply and so on. But we like to keep our, you know, we don't look more at Porto references as we do, for example, at Japanese references, at Swiss references. It's, it's very um, random in that sense. So it's not at all that we are trying to do local architecture at all. Yeah, I, I guess that's also happening. I mean, uh, I remember I was studying in Italy, but in that specific semester, I, I, I was working on the project in Porto by Portuguese professor. I just realized how different they are. I mean, my professor, a time professor, they, they will say like, preserve this, preserve that. Don't change this, don't change that. And suddenly when I was in Porto and I saw Alfaro Cesar architecture, for example, I mean, this is so much flexible, but uh, I guess I guess that's the difference. But you're I mean, talking, but you're uh, talking about the best architect alive. You're talking about a god among gods, and I think <laughs> uh, everything everything you know about Caesar is Caesar. That's the point. Everything we know about Fala is Fala. Everything about Shinohara is Shinohara, and I think that one of the things that happens in current time and at least since the postmodern movement is that everyone is pretty much himself there was a time where you know there were the modernists there was the school of thought of the metabolists there was team 10 you know and it was all about bringing consensus on the table a group different groups of people trying to understand common interests and doing things the same way today you have architects registering patents on their own designs as if no one else can do exactly what i do this is, I would say, the absolute opposite. So if before we were creating movements and systems, now everyone wants to have their own flag, like this is my thing, this is how I do it, no one else has anything to do with it. And Caesar is not like that. Caesar couldn't care any less about whatever everyone else is doing. He does a building in Brazil and he feels Brazilian. He does a building in the Netherlands and he feels Dutch. He does a building in Porto and he's from Porto. He does a building in Italy and he's Italian. So he's able, with a very generic and Caesar-like language, because he can always recognize a Caesar building, to just fit in any context without being pastiche, you know, without mimicking the context, by doing his own architecture, he always finds a way to be respectful. And I think that's truly valuable. But you also have other architects, example, OMA, whatever they go, they just say, well, fuck it, we do whatever we want, and boom, and their building shows up like that. And this is not, I'm not praising one and criticizing the other, I'm just saying it's possible to do both if you get a good building. Because if you respect the context and you do a terrible building, or if you disrespect the context and you do a terrible building, you're wrong That's both ways also. Every different context have different approaches to execute it. That's how big, how big our architecture for capitalism, many possibilities could happen. There's no specific that what we should say it right, you know? Everything mm -hmm. could be right. <laughs> okay. I mean, why everything if, is okay uh, if it's sorry. well done. Yeah, true. <laughs> So why, why everyone is shy tonight? There is no one who I'm raised actually, hands. I'm actually oh. spotting a couple of familiar faces on the crowd that I, I would be curious to, to hear a question from them. You should call them. You should call them to join us to discuss something. Oh, we already have one. Deandra Zara, are you there? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Felipe, for your presentation. It was uh, quite interesting to see your designing process. And uh, when I see some colleges' pictures or just certain of color palette itself, it just reminding me of your colleges that I saw in Instagram. Uh, that's the thing that I want to ask for you. Uh, is that any specific um, process that you are putting the patterns and the certain color palette 
uh, in your design process because I see there's some um, repetitive patterns that you will uh, that you always use in your projects and how do you come up with that decisions um, yeah <laughs> that's the that's the question I mean um, I saw earlier in your projects that you put like circle on the top of the beams and sometimes you put the circles to be the railing itself and uh, yeah I'm just curious about how do you come up with this um, designing process design thinking Yep. Well, thank you. There's, uh, thank you, thank you for your question. Um, let me let me think about how I can address. It. I think I know I know how to answer it. So, um, we don't have rules on how we do projects. Let's say there's not a recipe like on the first day we do this, on the second day we do that, and then in the end we put a circle on top. So this is not how it goes. And we don't have rules also in the sense that on the first day we do a plan, on the second we do a collage, and on the first we do a render. Also not like that. Not in terms of design and not in terms of tools we use. So it's a bit erratic in that sense. And uh, when we do when we do a project, we care a lot in the first stages to really understand the program because we know if the program is not in the right place, it will end up killing the project later. So we need to really understand what I was saying before. If we are asked for a house, we don't design a museum. So we need to understand exactly how that house is going to work. And in that process, define an architectural idea. And in that process, start sketching a plan. And in that process, moving towards collage and maybe a section. And in that process, start doing some 3Ds. And then going back a few steps and going up a few steps. And there are moments that become crucial. For example, when we have a plan that has very strong shapes, whatever kind, and the walls are white, I would argue it's almost logical for us to make the two horizontal surfaces, floor and ceiling, with a color or with a texture because that really emphasizes the geometrical principle of the walls when we have for example an existing building with certain columns in concrete for example we almost feel the appeal to celebrate them. we like the the on an almost irrational level to detach engineering from architecture we like to show you know that's a column that is holding a building let's applaud it you know or even more, we like to put a column that we like to say this column is holding nothing. Let's applaud it twice. So there's, there's a feeling. To that. There's also certain colors that we just feel comfortable with. There's this very deep blue we use very often with variations, shades of blue and shades of green. That is kind of, uh, it's our black. It's like a black that is less aggressive on a wall. You know, it's a black that went blue. But it's also pink, and pink is kind of, it's the inverted color of that blue, and it works precisely because of that. It's kind of uh, the inversion of something, you know, that works. So if you look at, you know, suprematist compositions, they did that a lot. They would use the opposite colors precisely because they would match exactly. And we use them in different scales. If there's a project that has a lot of pink, it has a little blue. If it has a lot of blue, it has a little pink, and so on and so forth. Other times we just paint everything in white. Uh, when we feel that the existing structure was so damaged on a conceptual level that we just need to fully annul it. And other times decisions happen by chance. Sometimes we just look at something and we need to solve a problem, like we need to do a handrail. And the handrail does not become a circle because it becomes a line and a square and this and that. And at some point when you look at the full picture, you understand, no, the best solution is actually to do this circle or this square or whatever. And sometimes we repeat patterns for different reasons. You know, for the same reason, every, of, every one of our projects has doors and windows. Like, and every project from CESA has doors and windows. That doesn't mean we are using them the same way. It just means that when you have a room and you need to close the door to go to the other room, you put a door in between. And we take that for granted. In our case, a certain pattern, a certain color, a certain visual effect becomes almost like a door and, uh, and a window. It's just something that you know that you need to assume or to solve that specific problem. Even if the problem is we need to detach the walls from the ceiling and the floor. So use a pattern, use a color, use something like that. Um, I honestly don't have a reason to justify every single column and every single circle as a whole, but I could justify individually each one of them. If I could explain, that was not the goal today in the presentation. If I would bring five projects and I would explain them in full, I would explain exactly why that circle, why that color, why that pattern. Um, but as a whole, there's no real reason. And many times, what is a column uh, in one of the projects becomes a circle in another one for the same reason, although they, in one case it's flat, in the other one it's a line, in the other one it's a volume. So I'd say that the compositional motivations are quite abstract in that sense. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much for your explanation because I thought at first it was kind of like the image that you're um, 
like trying to um, build because um, yeah. <laughs> and no, that's it's all. the opposite. Thank you. It's the complete. Okay. So, sorry, just to insist on this. It's the okay. complete opposite. We indeed, you know, if you have the same people in the same room doing projects that have the same brief and the same budget and the same context, you end up repeating something. So let's say this ambition of reinventing ourselves in every project, it's doomed to fail because we cannot just invent forever. There's going to be a point if we don't change the question, we don't change the answer. But um, we also don't want to do that, to have like, uh, oh, this is a boring building, put a circle on top and it becomes a follow project. We don't want that. Sometimes we even see, for example, students doing that. Like our students, when we teach, sometimes they uh, like they put that circle there just to say, you see, like I did, I did a project you like. And it's like, no, you're not understanding it. You did exactly the opposite. You did something I don't like because that's not how you should do. And the same thing applies with a collage. Like we don't want the collage. And we discussed many times to just stop publishing them once and for all because you see half of the questions somehow address the collage as if the collage is the production of the office. And I tried as much as possible on the presentation today in 200 slides to just have like seven that had collages because otherwise it becomes too much of a thing and we don't want it. So maybe next time we do a presentation, we don't show any collage at all so that it's not a topic. No, the collage is as important as a render, as a model, as a drawing, of course, yeah. because we do a lot of them. They are very important, but it's not uh, the end product. The end product is the building. Yes, I see. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Yanda. Um, okay, another question will be, oh, Nandi. I was seeing uh, Nandi. Uh, Is there Nandi? Hello? No, Alfonso de Cuaro. <laughs> okay. Can you uh, show your video? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Felipe. That was a very, very, very exciting presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, with, with the image that you presented, uh, that you represent, uh, it all of them almost have this two-dimensional quality in their picture, in their shapes, uh, with their flat geometry, which kind of feel almost supermatism, in a line of supermatism. Now, I want to ask, is this intentional or is this caused by the collage tools that you use? And if so, have you ever experimented outside of this collage tool in your practice? Thank you. That question comes at a great time. Yes, the answer is yes. It has a lot to do with it. The way how we built the images in the beginning kind of led us to produce very flat project proposals. And to a certain extent, I would say that in the beginning of our practice, the collage had a big impact in that sense. Like the way, you know, if you use a fork, you use it to eat. If you use a hammer, you use it to hammer. So you use different tools for different things. And if you try to hit with a hammer or to hammer with a fork, you know, it works, but it's kind of weird. And in the beginning, that happened a lot, that the collage was so much of a tool, uh, many times almost, and we were experimenting so deep with it and so, so radically with it, that it ended up confining, let's say, the project proposals in a way. Like it became, instead of opening the possibilities, it kind of narrowed down uh, a certain path uh, for this project. And, you know, seven, eight years later, we now look at the collage with a different critical standpoint. And it is true that we don't use it the same way anymore. It is true that we don't, uh, let's say, fantasize with this flatness. But it's also true that we understood the qualities of flatness. So by forcing ourselves to do that, even if unconsciously or accidentally, we ended up learning how to use it you know it's like that thing you don't want to do but because you did it that summer in 1998 uh. you now have that knowledge in your mind and you cannot ignore it it's a bit like that and uh flatness has a lot of qualities flatness is cheap for example and if you work with low budgets you will understand that detailing is not where you're going to spend your energy Many times we do our projects with very little detailing. Sometimes we finish the detailing at one to 25 scale. So there's no details and let's see on site what happens. And this has a lot to do with both the flat detail, you know, the, the way how you do things. It has a lot to do with certain mental principles. For us, it's really important if the door is in the middle of the wall, so like this, or in front of the wall or behind the wall, because this means that in the main room, you're gonna see the door as an object 
the door as a normal door in a wall or the door inside the secondary room. So you're going to emphasize the width of the, door, uh, of the wall. So this is important for us. But the actual detail you do on this, it's not, it's not crucial. We know how to do it. We know how to do detail to a certain extent. But it's not the most important aspect of the project. It's much more important to understand, is the, wall go, is the door going to be white or black? or blue, pink, this is much more important than if the detail is super minimal and looks like a sad John Poston project. That's not important at all for us. What is really important is what that door means either to the main space or to the secondary space. And how, how the collage helped us on this. On the collage, that's the only thing you work. You don't work the details on the collage. On the collage, you don't have the opportunity to do the door detail. You just have a rectangle that is in front of a white surface. Therefore, what you discuss with a collage is the impact of that rectangle. So what becomes really important when you look at a project from a collage perspective is what's the color of that door? What is that door trying to do? Is that door on the other side or on this side? That's, that, that's how far the discussion can go. And then in six months from now on a construction site, when the carpenter arrives, he's going to ask you exactly which hinges do you want to use? And then you discuss with him, you sketch on the wall and you define the detail on the side. But on a conceptual level, you understand what the door means and represents long before you understand how it's actually going to be joined and built and detailed and that's to answer your question what we learned from the flatness of collage that we apply on a daily basis things are much more um, let's say the different objects of like like all of these objects we detach the columns the the, the curtains the, the the furniture the kitchens we detach them because either on this in, in, in the photoshop file we detach them also so there's a bit of there's a bit of that egg and chicken process in that case yes oh i see okay thank you I was very Thank you, Nandi. Okay. Uh, do, do you still have time for two more questions? It's 5 p.m. in Porto, so as oh, you prefer. True. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. Another question will be from, from Lalu. Lalu, do you want to speak directly or should I read it? Go uh, on. Um, I think th there is a conception in when uh, I was in college that there's uh, we we do drawings because there is uh, possibilities that we can deliver or represent in a drawing, but at the same time there's a limit on what the drawing is. And uh, do, have you ever felt the the limit on uh, the draw that you do or something that you want to express but you can't do it on a, on a drawing, so you have to do on another uh, medium, for example, or when you have that limit, uh, do you what is it? Uh, do you push that limit to, uh, to another one? You, you experiment with it or something? Yes, Maybe. yes. I think that's 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 more or less what what I wanted to say when we started the presentation by showing the different tools that. Um, let's say we call them lenses because when we look at a project from the plan or from the collage or from the render or from the model we see different things and i think that um in order to fully express your um your uh, ambitions as an author you need to use those different uh, those different words and there's a quote we many times have on the slides that is from sotsas that it says that the word love and the word amore in Italian mean very different things. They kind of say the same thing, but in English, it's a very dry feeling. But in Italian, it has a romanticism and a different reading that gives it a slightly different perception. So I would argue that um, when we do a plan or a model or a collage or a render of matter, we are, and not we fall, I would say architects in general, any architect and any author, any artist, whatever, we are expressing different things. And, um, if, if today, for example, instead of me doing the presentation, Anna or Ahmed were here presenting the same PDF and the same content and doing the same projects, you would probably get also a different energy or a different, let's say, presentation. Uh, because if every time you change the lens or the speaker or the tool, you somehow start getting different, different results. And uh, yeah, we, we very often try new tools precisely because we want to try to understand how far we can take a certain idea. And um, for example, those drawings I showed before, the comprehensive drawings, the drawing that has all the ideas of the project in a single drawing, 
we used to do those really at the end of the project. So it was a thing that you would extract from the project. When the project was done, you would do that run. And now what we do in many projects is in the middle of the process, we are doing that drawing. And we are trying to understand if that drawing as a drawing as a kind of individual piece it's balanced it has the right amount of ingredients it has the right complexity and this is interesting because something that for us was a finished thing a finished product became a tool and ironically also there are drawings with it in the past that now uh, we sell to collectors and we put in museums so they that were not finished products they became autonomous pieces of art on their own, which is kind of insane also. So yes, to answer your question, we many times need to try different angles and different tools uh, to answer the questions we don't know how to answer with the tools we have on the table. Okay, thank you for the insight, because uh, that's what I, exactly, exactly uh, uh, what I've experienced right now is a, there's a diagram that I don't feel like it's represent my idea, and then I try two or three days to uh, experiment on how I can express my imagination and ideas on that because uh, that's what I experience right now that uh, well I try to do uh, I try to communicate my, my, my imagination in one single drawing but when I do that with uh, uh, axonometric for example and uh, it's kind of too too noisy and 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 cannot, uh, cannot speak for itself I think and I don't know. I mean, uh, imagine, imagine the career of Le Corbusier without concrete. Or imagine the career of Zaha Hadid without a computer. I mean, Zaha Hadid did outstanding paintings in the 80s and early 90s. But if computers were not there, her architecture would struggle to exist. And now that it exists, a lot of other architects today, they do what we could call Zaha Hadid-inspired geometries. And the same thing applies to, you know, Corbusier. Whatever Corbusier invented, then it became a mainstream and now today it's so digested you don't even think about it. Like, I think that uh, architectural language and architectural tools, so the tools we use to design, are to a certain extent like that. Once they are not there and from the moment they are there, they are able to be adapted, transform, evolve, etc. And you have to be the one deciding whatever you want to do. Because corporate architecture is a disease. Corporate architecture is not architecture. It's fine as a discipline. It's just something else. It should not be called architecture. It should be called, you know, Xerox construction. Like you just Xerox. you just copy several times the same thing and, and you have computers doing it. You could create software that could do corporate architecture. When What we're talking about today and when we talk about CISA, when we talk about Shinohara, when we talk about Peter Markley, we are talking about architecture with capital A. We are talking about architecture as a discipline. We are talking about the, the core, the, the soul of what architecture should be. And with that architecture, there's no rules. I mean, you cannot, if you had a, if you had a meeting, a sit down between Caesar, Markley and Shinohara, they would try to prove each other to be wrong. But the point is that the three of them are right. You see, that's, that's kind of the thing. And uh, in that sense, I would always suggest, and I, I know I'm, I'm selling you the half full glass, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the optimist, I'm the dreamer today. And in this kind of situations, that's what it should be. But think about this this way. You, as an author, choose the path you want to follow. So choose one you enjoy. Choose one that you like and do something you appreciate. Thank you for the insight. I think this is an amazing quote. Thank you, Lalo. Okay, moving to the last question. Um, well, actually, um, the guy who asked, Alfred Nugra, hi, hi Philip. Uh, as non-architect, I found the topic about column really caught me, oh, sorry, really caught my attention. I've seen lots of buildings here in Indonesia, mostly houses that incorporated columns into their designs. Uh, from the ones that are located in and around Jakarta, the, the capital city, uh, even to this particular house located in the middle of the rice field that basically in the middle of nowhere. That made me think that columns in house, columns in houses somehow symbolize wealth or social status. Now, what I want to ask is, since you stated that you love columns, have you ever thought about making a building or structures that generally made out of columns? I always, thought uh, that if we put columns in, in information, 
thinking of Stonehenge, it will create a sense of room. Well, no, that's a complex question. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> see any social status associated with columns. I should start by saying that I, I see columns as architectural and construction and engineering devices. And um, the way how we use them, and I often say we celebrate columns, it's because we usually give them a lot of emphasis. And we, instead of doing what construction usually does, does which is to hide the column in the facade or to hide the column on the wall, if we have a column, and it's not somehow obstructing the way, we will somehow express it. Um, but if we thought about projects made out of columns, yes, uh, we did a few competition proposals in the last years that we always lost, because the thing you need to know is that we lose a lot of competitions and we lose in, in style. We, we lose with a complete notion that we were gonna lose. Like we know a priori it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Because we are, uh, we are a bit optimist. Uh, we always do whatever we think we should do. We, we, we don't sacrifice, we don't compromise anything on the project and then, well, then we lose. But we did a lot of projects already that gravitate around the idea of the column becoming not an element in front of a wall, but a defining element of the space. We did a competition proposal for a museum in Dessau in Germany, where the whole grid of columns becomes the building. We built a small installation. Well, we designed it for New York, but we built it in Belgium. Uh, there was a room made out of columns with no ceiling. So the, 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 let's say the density of columns would define spaces, circulations, etc. This, this is something that has been in the back of our mind, but because most of our projects today, let's say the, the, the overall direction, the commissions and the, the projects have does not really fit, that idea we didn't play it yet, but I would not close the door to trying that at some point in the future. It, it just needs to be, you know, not all ideas fit at all projects. So we need to have the right project and let's say the right moment and the right time to apply to apply that as a principle. But in that case, the column becomes a different thing. So in that case, in that project, the column becomes the white wall. So it becomes the, the element that defines space. And probably the white wall in that project becomes an isolated element that behaves as the column behaves in the current projects. I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm speculating. Well, I guess that was the last question. So I guess we, we are already done. And once again, okay, everyone give a virtual applause to Philip. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, like one thing. Uh, I, uh, I I told you before. Right? After after knowing Father Atelier, I started doing this post digital images, and and then I didn't know about David Hockney at the time. Can you imagine that? How lack of our information is back here, or it's, it was just me? I don't know. <laughs> and then a few months after, I visited the I guess the. The, the full exhibition of David Hockney in Sensory Pompidou in Paris. That was, I just, I just realized that this is so far. I mean, <laughs> at the time, but I just, what I was, what, what I about to say is just, um, it's all about fascination, right? It's totally legal to be inspired by something. I mean, Aldo Rossi was inspired by, by Giorgio de, Siri, de Chirico. I mean, and he creates some other else's. And I, I think you created something else's. I mean, it's like, it's kind of different feelings. Uh, that's, that's kind of you, it's kind of, uh, you, you create some different feelings. And that, I think that's your, the contribution from, from you, from Fala Atelier into the world of architecture. So, so that's a giant applause for me. I get some other okay. audiences also. So again, again, I have to say thank you again. So uh, I remember 2018, I, I guess you were invented, uh, sorry, you were invited in the opening of Venice Biennale, right? Yes. In one of the events. I suppose talking... to be that, yes, in Treochi, right? In the Treochi yeah, gallery. In the, in, the, in the English pavilion, in the British pavilion, in the British pavilion, oh, the British pavilion. there was in, a in round table. No, no, yeah, it was that pavilion, but in the main room. It was actually one of the weirdest moments ever because I was the last one to arrive and there were like 20 speakers. So I sat on, on the last seat 
And then, um, then there was the, they pushed another chair next to me and they said, no one sits here. And I waited for a few minutes and suddenly someone arrived and sat there and I did not pay attention. And then they were sharing the mic around and at some point I looked to my right and there's David Cheaperfield. And I was like, oh my God, oh God. <laughs> and you know, it's like the moment where you have one of those guys, one of them. And it was very nice because uh, although only what was being said on the mic that was running around was heard, I had the opportunity every time there was a question because there were 20 speakers, too many things, too many people sharing the mic. I had the opportunity to discuss in private with David Chipperfield all the questions. So it was like, uh, <laughs> it was a very funny uh, coincidence because he was not meant to show up and then he showed up last minute and, you know, they kind of put him there on the corner and I had a chance to discuss with him for like one hour about all the questions that were asked. And he's actually a very charming guy. So he's not as arrogant, I would imagine, being such a big figure. It was a very down-to-earth uh, discussion. I really enjoyed it. Well, yeah, I, I met him also at, at the time, but, but not in the British Pavilion. I met since another Pavilion from Andra Martin uh, in, in Arsenale. Actually, I supposed to be there. <laughs> I supposed to be there. I'm curious to watch your lecture. But, you know, at the time, my girlfriend asked me to another place, so I didn't went there. Well, today, today is exactly to replace that day. So, <laughs> so my curiosity is quite okay now. <laughs> so, I guess that's all. Uh, Philippe, so have a nice day. Uh, obrigado. Obrigado, Leo. <laughs> and uh, for all of you guys, uh, don't worry, next week we also we will also have another edition of Problem And tonight we were uh, having had very great lecture from Philip about Valentina. So thanks for coming. Uh, thank you who are always here. And we already trying back to be to, to the normal life, but you are still here in the virtual world. So thank you. Thank you so much for all the audiences. So, okay. Uh, my name is Randy Hendrawan. Uh, I'm from Rabu Media. We are uh, a collective of architecture based in Surabaya, Indonesia. We're trying to bridge in between the conceptuality and, and pragmatic, pragmaticality in architecture. And our big vision is to create uh, civilization in Indonesia. So thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, uh, all of you guys. Uh, have a good evening and have a good day. Bye. Bye.